Soundstripe. Hello, I'm Christy Lynn Horpadal, an assistant editor at Adam Smith Works, and this is the Smith Questionnaire. Our guest today is Eric Matson, a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason and the deputy director of the GMU Adam Smith program. Welcome, Eric. It's nice to have you. Thanks, Christy. It's good to be here. Great. So we'll jump right in. Question number one, would you rather be loved or be lovely? I, I guess it depends on the day. Um, you know, of course, as, as a reader of Smith, I'd like to say that I, uh, I'd rather be loved. There are times when I think, sorry, as a reader of Smith, I, I, I'd like to say I'd rather be lovely, but you know, there's days where I think I'd opt for loved over lovely. Well, luckily, if you are lovely, often that leads to getting to be loved as well. It's one of the nice this is true. This is true. It's not a fail safe, but it's yeah, generally true. <laughs> Would you rather wealth of nations or theory of moral sentiments? Theory of moral sentiments. Smith is very concerned about what the division of labor does to people's intellectual lives. So what do you think is the best antidote to the torpor induced by the division of labor? Uh, reading, I think, sports, trying to engage in public activities, family. Smith says that one of the times we experience sympathy is when we share an appreciation for the same piece of literature or work of art. What do you think people should read or listen to or watch to feel sympathy with you? I, over the last few years, I've uh, developed an interest in epic fantasy. I read recently all, I think, 12 Wheel of Time books. There's a TV show, which is not a good substitute for the books, but the books are excellent. Great character development, great world building. So that's what I might say. Uh, that's a great suggestion. And it'll keep people very busy. Um, there's they're, a lot. They're thick books. Have you read them before? It's been a long time. Um, I read them, I think, I started when I was in high school, so it's uh, yeah. the memories are vague uh, for you sure. Kinda, but... You kind of get get trapped in books. At least most people I talk to get trapped in like books eight to ten. I think maybe there's fourteen books actually. Now that I think about it, but anyways, you get kind of stuck in those books, but then you come out of the tail end, and it's well worth well worth the effort. Yeah, and uh, it's nice that there's more good books in the series. Um, so that's a great suggestion. Okay. So it is back to school time. So I feel bad recommending a huge book series right when school is about to start. But that had me thinking about how Smith was a professor too for, for many years of his life. What do you think Smith liked about being a professor or kind of going back to school? And what do you think Smith didn't like about the activity of being a professor? Hmm. I, I think Smith probably really enjoyed interacting with with his students. I mean, they were mostly, you know, teenage boys, actually all teenage boys. Um, I imagine he got a real joy out of that. I think he took his obligations as an instructor very seriously. You know, when he went off to tutor the uh, Duke of Buclu, he returned the course fees to all of his students. He insisted that they take, you know, the money back for, for the remainder of the term that he couldn't teach. So he was, I think he was dedicated to his task and, and I imagine he really enjoyed, you know, working, working with, with the kids. What did he not enjoy? I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe the obligation to prepare, you know, lectures daily. I think back, back in the 18th century, they had a pretty rigorous teaching load, something that most academics now wouldn't stand for or would complain about quite a bit. Maybe it was very intense. He didn't, you know, had less time to travel and see his friends and write. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing those. Um, economics has changed a lot since the time of Smith. He saw some of those changes. He started some of those changes. But what development in the field of economics since Smith do you think that he would really appreciate or be curious about? 
I think the, the development of experimental and behavioral economics, I, I don't think he would sympathize with a lot that behavioral economists do these days or some of the conclusions they draw from their results. But I think the idea of looking at behavior and trying to merge actual empirical studies of behavior and insights in psychology with you know, blackboard economic theories would, would be of great interest. And that's really the spirit of, of his two books, you know. So early in his life, before he wrote those two big books, he was interested in astronomy and the history of astronomy. I've been inspired by the James Webb photos. And sometimes I think about what would Smith think about these amazing images that we have from the edges of the universe. But that also got me thinking, do you think that Smith would believe in alien life and the possibility of there being life on other planets that will someday contact or interact with? That's a great question. I think I think he would be open to the possibility. Yeah, I think so. You know, the whole point of the astronomy essay is that our understanding of the world, our understanding of the universe is contingent. And we make we make some progress. We develop models that do a better job explaining the world and dealing with dealing with what we see and observe. But at the end of the day, there's always more to know. There's always a better explanation. There's always things outside of our experience set that cause us to wonder. And so I think he would be open to alien life. I think he'd be amazed by the James Webb photos. He would he would wonder and marvel at the, the bigness of the world, the bigness of the universe, and the small place that humans occupy in that universe. Wonder, perhaps surprise, and admiration. I think you could feel all those things. Um, yeah. So what is the most interesting thing that you know about Smith's life? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I know anything particularly interesting that would at least surprise people who study Smith. I, there's a lot of fun anecdotes that some, some that I can recall off the top of my head. Um, I think once he put a piece of bread in a teapot and poured the cup of tea. I, I don't remember who he was with and he poured the cup of tea and he drank it and he said something like, Madame, this is simply the worst cup of tea I've had in my life. So there's a lot of kind of eccentric anecdotes that you can find in his biographies. Uh, he was a little bit of an oddball, I think, socially. We'll uh, recommend some of the biographies of Smith too when we post this so people can get some more of that if they're interested. Sure. Um, so I've got two more questions, second to last question. Um, what is something about Adam Smith that you think everybody or a lot of people get wrong? If you could kind of help fix one misconception about Smith, what would you choose to fix? What do you think people need to understand that they're often confused or mistaken about? That's another good question. I, I think it depends on the audience. I think different groups have different misconceptions of Smith. I think the general public has this idea that Smith was some kind of a amoral champion of markets. And I think that's wrong and that presents a kind of distinction between ethics and economics that would have been foreign to Smith. Smith's advocacy for free markets, his advocacy of the liberal plan, what he calls the liberal plan, is sort of nested within his ethical framework. And he wants to promote the good of humankind. And so it's all in service of that higher end. And so his economics is really downstream of this broader moral project. I think that's what what people tend to to miss, at least in popular discourse, when when they bring up Smith as some kind of just ignorant, dogmatic champion of economics. I definitely wish more people understood that and the connection between his his projects and how important that was to him. Okay, last question, fun question: Do you think the impartial spectator is more like a dog or more like a cat? 
Hmm. I, I have to say more like a dog. I, I really, there are some cats that I like, but in general, I, I think dogs are much, much more sympathetic. I think cats have a very hard time entering into human experience. I think dogs, I'm not sure if, if dogs are less intelligent. Uh, I don't think so, but they certainly are much more effective at sympathizing with people where they are. Well, that's all for my formal questions, um, but I did wanna ask you about a paper you published recently in the Southern Economic Journal. It's called, What is Liberal About Adam Smith's Liberal Plan? And I was hoping you would just tell us a little bit about what that paper is about. Yeah, sure. The paper investigates the question, what's liberal about Smith's liberal plan? That question is interesting because the word liberal wasn't used in a political sense at all prior to the 18th century. And Smith was one of the earliest writers to use that word liberal, the English word liberal uh, in a definitely political way. The word had a long rich history prior to Smith. So it's worth investigating why did he choose that word to describe his political sensibilities. And the answer that I propose is that Smith believes that his liberal plan in political economy promotes ends that a liberal, that is a generous, munificent person, ought to approve of. Well, thank you. I'll put a link to that paper um, when we post this as well. So thank you for being with us today. And that is the end of the Smith questionnaire. Thanks, Christy. Soundstripe. <laughs>